Hello, it's Stuart Crawford here again. And for this podcast, we're going to be back on familiar territory and looking at more aspects from the current Russo-Ukraine conflict. We're now roughly 535 days or so into Vladimir Putin's planned three-day special military operation that began back in February 2022. That statistic alone tells us that things have not panned out the way he may have hoped they would. What's the state of play at the moment? Well, stalemate, you may think, at least on the ground in Ukraine. But it's actually worse than stalemate for Putin. He's losing in every domain in which he is engaged. Let's have a wee bit of a look at that in detail. In the field, his armies have been rebuffed, ground to a halt, and have transitioned mainly to the defensive. Their losses have been horrendous, both in equipment and in personnel. So much so, in fact, that he's had to extend the age range for conscription to provide sufficient troops to keep his war going and bring in ancient 50-year-old tanks out of storage to re-equip his regiments. He then suffered the embarrassment um, of the mutiny of his erstwhile friend Prizogin's Wagner Group, which took over Russian headquarters in Rostov-on-Don and started marching up the motorway to Moscow. This was diffused by Putin's ally, ally President Lukashenko of Belarus, and the Wagner Group was eff- effectively disarmed and sent into exile. But the blow to Putin's prestige has been considerable. The Ukrainian armed forces are now battering away at Russian defence lines along a 1,000 kilometre front line. Neither side is making much progress in a slugging match reminiscent of the First World War. Gains are measured in hundreds of metres, casualties in their thousands. Putin's armies are stuck. At sea, things have gone just as badly. Russia's Black Sea Fleet is now basically bottled up in its ports, hemmed in by increasingly effective Ukrainian attacks based largely on their innovative sea drones and on anti-ship missiles in the main donated by the West. Things started badly for Putin with the loss of the Black Black Sea flagship, the Moskva, to drone attack, and have just got worse since. Not only has the strategic Kerch Bridge been attacked successfully at least twice by sea drones, but so too have an increasing number of Russian naval ships, despite increased defensive measures. Much of the Black Sea is now denied to Putin's ships. And in the air, things are hardly better. An early indication of how things might develop occurred at Hostomol Airport just outside Kiev when the Russian coup de main operation to capture it from the air failed miserably with several of their helicopters shot down. The Russian Air Force, primarily designed to counter NATO operations by defeating Western aircraft in the air, has found trying to tackle the extensive Ukrainian ground-based air defences hard going to the extent that they now seldom venture further forward than the front line of their own troops, and when they do, they tend to incur heavy losses. Meanwhile, Russia has proved vulnerable to Ukrainian drone attacks from the air. Russian Crimean military bases such as Sevastopol and nearby air bases have been struck many times, while Moscow itself has been subjected to multiple attacks. While the damage to the Russian capital to date has been slight, the propaganda value of those strikes should not be underestimated. On top of all this, Putin is also losing the information war. Helped by NATO intelligence and information assets, the Ukrainians have presented their cause to the world with much greater skill and effect than have the Russians. Ukraine's President Zelensky has proved to be a master of public relations and the media soundbite, 
while Putin's appearances on his state-controlled media looked contrived and insincere. Ukraine's mastery of the infosphere is overwhelming. Finally, Western economic and diplomatic sanctions on Russia have really begun to have effect. Putin's administration has been forced to look further and further afield to China, North Korea and Iran to find the components and materials to keep the Russian defence industries turning over. The ruble has tumbled in value and defence spending has increased markedly. Russia's economy is creaking badly and it may take decades to recover, if it does at all. All of this has been the direct result of Putin's ill-judged attempt to turn Ukraine into a benign puppet state under the domination and direction of its larger neighbour. His personal megalomania and deluded mission to recreate Greater Russia, his version of Make America Great Again, if you like, was doomed from the very start. The problem is that none of Putin's inner circle has the wit or courage to tell him so and arrest the continued Russian decline. It has always been so with dictators throughout history. Only when he is gone, either via a coup or through his ill health and diminishing powers, will there be any hope of peace returning to Ukraine.